All right, church, it is time to get started this morning. Pull up my Bible app so we can read some scripture. We are fifth week of Lent. Lent is the season that leads up to Easter as the conflict and the tension as Jesus marches toward Jerusalem and, of course, his cross and the resurrection <clears throat> builds. Next week is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is when we get to the part of the story where Jesus enters into Jerusalem triumphantly and make, takes a major turn. But today, we are still in that season of anticipating leading toward uh, Jesus' death with that conflict. And so our text this morning is from John chapter 12. John chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 20. I just want to go ahead and read it, then we'll jump in with some thoughts without um, much to do. So John chapter 12, starting in verse 20. Now some Greeks were among those who had gone up in order to worship at the feast. So these approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and began asking him, saying, Sir, we want to see Jesus. So Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man will be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The one who loves his life loses it, and the one who hates his life in this world preserves it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour. But for this reason I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now the crowd that stood there heard it and uh, said it had thundered. Others were saying, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice has not happened for my sake, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be thrown out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Now, he said this to indicate by what sort of death he was going to die. All right. So there's a lot of things going on in this text, a lot of really good things going on in this text that we want to kind of think about in a, a broad sort of way this morning as we try to wrap our heads around what is going on in the life of Jesus and uh, as we try to think about what that might mean for us. And so one particular thing that we might say starting out is that whenever you're reading a story in the Bible, uh, really any story, but for our purposes, reading a story in the Bible, one of the ways that the author can um, kind of point us toward the emphasis of the story is to repeat things. And so, you know, there's that old adage in education, repetition is the key to learning. Repetition is the key to learning. Repetition is the key to learning. Um, we could keep going with that, of course, but I won't torture you with uh, my Sunday morning uh, dad joke and maturity. But when the author repeats something, that is our cue that we need to pay attention to what is going on. And so in John 12, one of the things that we see repeated again and again and again, several times over in this short little text, is this idea of glorifying it's almost time for Jesus to be glorified. He prays that the God, Father will be glorified. The Father says, I have glorified myself and I will glorify myself again. And in particular, as we start to uh, think about this notion of being glorified, which by the way, isn't a particularly religious term. It's just a term that says, I'm going to uh, hold this person up over others. Uh, glorifying is when your kid comes home with a good grade on a, um, a test or, or an assignment or an art project and as a proud mom or dad you put it on the refrigerator you have glorified them you're holding them up uh, you're exalting or establishing that, that's the basic idea behind glorifying but as we cue into John's repetition of this notion of Jesus being glorified or the Father being glorified through him um, we start to pick up on this echo, variety of things that happen in the Old Testament, particularly when Jesus said, it is almost time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Uh, that itself has a particular echo going back to the book of Daniel. And in Daniel, Daniel has this nightmare starting off. He has this dream. And in the dream, he uh, dreams of these monsters 
and in the interpretation of the dream as you go through the text you realize that these monsters represent the various powers of the world these are the monsters that rule over that are in charge of the way things are and we've used this language for years now but when i say the way things are i want you to hear um, someone on one side protesting against the brokenness of the world why do bad things happen to good people um, why is there so much violence and corruption? Why can't we seem to get anything done? And some wise person, quote unquote, will say, well, son, that's just the way things are. In Daniel's dream, these monsters are those who rule over the way things are. They represent um, the global powers throughout the history of Daniel's day. Uh, the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks and then the Romans. And so he has this nightmare in the book of Daniel and um, these monsters, these powers over the way things are in the world. Uh, they do battle with one another. They vie for domination and power and control over the way things are. And it is a very frightening scene. There are these ferocious monsters. But halfway through the dream, uh, it changes from a nightmare full of monsters to a courtroom drama. The Ancient of Days, God, in the dream, comes and he sets up his courtroom, his throne room, where he is going to hold trial, and he brings the monsters in and he judges them as guilty. He condemns them and he sweeps them aside as insufficient for what he wants for the world. And so this is, in Daniel's dream, the Ancient of Days way of saying, the way things are will never stand. The way things are, are not the way things should be. They are not the way God wanted things to be. And so, in response to that, the judge, the Ancient of Days, the one who has condemned the monsters, the one who has swept them aside, who has condemned the way things are in the favor of the way things should be, then exalts, in Daniel's dream, he glorifies, in Daniel's dream, one who is like a son of man. He glorifies the Son of Man, establishing him as the ruler, as the king, as the one who is in charge, over against the monsters who are in charge of the way things are. And this king, Daniel's dream tells us, is the one who will usher in not the way things are, not that's just the way the world works, but the way things should be. He will usher in righteousness in the place of unrighteousness and peace in the midst of violence and, and uh, joy in the midst of sorrow. He will usher in light in the midst of darkness. And this great reversal will come about when the Son of Man is glorified. That is, the Son of Man is exalted by the Ancient of Days to the throne to rule in ways that um, the way things are, those monsters, those powers have failed to do. And when you set Daniel's dream in the back of your mind, then you go back to John 12 and you start reading what is going on there. Um, you see that Jesus is referring to that dream. Uh, the powers over the darkness, the powers that kind of rule over the way things are in John 12, they are being condemned. They are being judged. They are being cast aside. They are being showed as lacking and wanting and short of what God wants for the world. And the Son of Man, in response to that, is being glorified, is being exalted. And the Father is glorifying himself through that. What we are talking about in John chapter 12, the way Jesus frames his death. In John chapter 12, through this dream that Daniel had centuries earlier, is that when Jesus goes to the cross, that when Jesus dies and then ultimately is resurrected and ultimately ascends to the throne to sit at the Father's right side in heaven, which is the control room of earth, how Jesus frames this is to say that the way things are can never stand with all of the violence and the injustice and the unrighteousness, with all of the, all of the, um, the pain and the suffering and the hurt, with all the darkness and the brokenness, with all of the sorrow and the grief. God never wanted any of this for his world. And those powers that perpetuate that way of world, sin and death and all of their manifestations and all of their friends, and it comes to play in political manifestations and religious manifestations and social manifestations and cultural manifestations and, and economic manifestations. We just keep going with this. All of the ways that it's manifested, it will never do. 
God will never let this stand. This is not what God wanted for his world. And so God is judging the way things are and the powers over the way things are, those who benefit from the way things are. And he is establishing in contrast to the way things are, this king, this son of man, this Messiah, we would call him, who in turn will establish the way things should be the way God always wanted things to be. And so the Son of Man is going to be glorified. Jesus looks forward to his death and he frames it in terms of this dream that Daniel has. He is going to be glorified. But it's interesting for us to think about how this plays out. Some Sometimes it's hard for us because this has become such second, second nature to us. Of course, Jesus went to the cross. Of course, Jesus died. Of course, Jesus was tortured by the Romans. Uh, that we miss the power of it. Because in the ancient world, everybody knew that the way that you glorify someone, the way that you exalt someone, is not through or the way that you exalt yourself, even the way that you, uh, in the framing of Daniel, you get rid of those who uh, have been in power and you take power, is through bringing their death. It's through defeating them. It's through the uh, exertion of power over them, through, through dominance, and this is the way the world works. If we see something that needs to be stopped, if we see something that is broken, if we see something that needs to be done away with in our way of looking at things, the way we address those problems, the way we tackle our monsters is to get power over those monsters. So we over here are the good guys. We wear the white hats. And those guys over there, they're the bad guys. They, they wear the black hats. And the way that the guys with the white hats take care of the people with the black hats is we overpower them with righteous violence or righteous power, and we do away with them. The way that we uh, take care of problems in the world is that we outspend or outshout or outvote or outlegislate or outbomb them. And this is the way things have gone on for uh, centuries and centuries and centuries and millennia. This is the way things have always happened from Cain and Abel all the way forward. But here, Jesus, I want you to see, Jesus introduces a new way of looking at this. And this is paradigmatic for us as Christians. This is a new way of looking at things that we have to take seriously, that we have to follow. Jesus, at the very end there, says, he says, the Son of Man is going to be glorified the beginning, that God is going to be glorified through the Son of Man being glorified. And very easily in their mind, they could have imagined a variety of scenarios. Jesus is going to come in and he's going to wipe out the Romans. And this was an option for Jesus. He, he, he thought about this. You'll remember, I believe it was in Matthew's gospel particularly, that um, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is right before he's arrested and, and he's going to go off and he's going to be crucified. And Peter takes out a sword and starts whacking off people's ears and things like that. And Jesus tells him to put his sword away. And he says, don't you think that I could just ask and my father would send legions of angels. Jesus had the power to play this power over game better than anybody else. Jesus' power outmatched that of the Roman armies. Jesus' power outmatched that of the Jewish religious leaders' influences. Jesus could have ended the entire thing with perfect judgment with perfect righteousness, with the snap of his finger. He had the power to do that. And so you can only imagine the disciples having watched all of these miracles that he's performed, all of these things that, that he's done. You can only imagine when they start hearing him draw in this dream from uh, Daniel, this nightmare turned courtroom drama with the Son of Man being glorified. The Son of Man is about to be glorified. They immediately start thinking, oh, now it is time for Rome to fall. Now it is time for our enemies to get what's coming to them. Now they're going to get payback for all the things they did to us. The Son of Man is going to be glorified. And indeed, that's the way that we think about things today. It's time for us to put our person in office. It's time for us to get back at them for what we have done. It's time to uh, make the world a better place by ascending to power and dethroning those people by getting more power than them. And then Jesus comes in and he says, the Son of Man is about to be glorified. The powers of the world is, are about to be condemned. The Father is about to be glorified. He has been and he will be again. And then he says, when I am lifted up, 
all of the people will be drawn to me. And it says at the very end of the text that he said this to indicate the manner in which he would die. The Son of Man is glorified not through defeating his enemies, but through loving his enemies. The Son of Man is glorified. He, he is enthroned. The way things should be is ushered into the world over against the way things are, not through killing his enemies, but by being killed by his enemies. And this is something in our world where we are in love with power, where frankly we will sacrifice lots of things that we say are important for the sake of having power, of protecting our rights that we need to take seriously. The way of Jesus is not the uh, path of climbing the ladder at whatever cost so that we can grab the gears of power and make a difference in the world. That is the way things are. The way of Christ is the way of the cross. The way of loving enemies, the way of laying power down, the way of service, the way of transforming the world from the bottom. That is the path toward the way things should be. And right here at the crux of the conflict between Jesus and the world is this difference. As a matter of fact, it is so pointed, so poignant that by the time we come to the cross, what we find is that we have in this moment where Jesus is brought to his death, the powers of the world bring all of the power and the influence they bear in this one single point. The might of the Roman Empire weighs down on Jesus with all of the violence it can muster. Because at the end of the day, the worst thing it could do to a single person is to take their life in the most horrific form possible. That's what they intend to do. The might of the religious establishments come to bear on Jesus with all of the force they can muster. Death and sin on Golgotha, they... Um, come to focus all of their power. They bring their worst to the cross. And what Jesus brings to the cross is not his power, but his love. The cross is framed as a trial, a battle, a conflict between the way of the world with all of its power, all of its violence, and all of its domination, and the way of God, which is the way of love who could use power, who has power, but lays that down for the sake of dying on the cross. And in our logic and the way of the world, that seems insane. It seems foolishness. It seems weakness. It seems like Paul might have had something to say about that. But as we know, that at the end of the day, the cross was the strength of God, even though it was the foolishness of men. And it was or the weakness of men, it was the, the wisdom of God, even though it was the foolishness of men. That on Good Friday, for all the ways it looked like the violence and the darkness and the domination of the world had won that battle, God was dead. God laid in a tomb. The end could never stop God. God was bigger than death. God was bigger than violence. God was bigger than domination. And in doing so, the Son of Man was glorified. And he ushered in a new world, not the way things are, but the way things should be. And you and I, dear brothers and sisters, we are part of that movement. So I'm going to pray for us now because I'm almost out of time. I've got 52 seconds. Let's, let's pray. God, may we be followers of Jesus. May we pledge our allegiance to him and not to the powers of this world. Teach us what that means and how that looks. Give us the wisdom to live that out with faithfulness. We come and we pray as a family. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Church, we love you. We hope to see you soon, and it gets closer every day. Can't wait to get up early on a Sunday morning and make that trip over to Middle Tennessee again. Have a great week.